going to be for Muhammad to show me that Islam, the big I, the real <laughs> historical Islam, is the real Islam. We're going to show you the big C Christianity. There is only one Christianity, and that's the historical Christianity. You, God bless you. Over to you, Muhammad. Thank you very much, Jake. This is really going to become very embarrassing today. No, no. No, no. Let them decide that. No, 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 no. This is going to be really, really embarrassing today. He says that the first books of Hadith, or the first books of, let's say, compilation of Ibn Hisham, Ibn Ishaq, which you couldn't pronounce properly, and I'm sure that he has not been able to tap those books in the primary source material because. Let us sit down to the Kalam the Lugal Arabi al so you can't speak Arabic, so you can't that's access the books. Excuse me, calm down. That's point number one. Point number two here is what I wanted to make. Can you hear me, guys? Yeah? Is that he is making the fallacy of believing that because the compilers compiled the hadith 200 to 300 years after the Prophet's death, that the hadith didn't exist before that. How? embarrassing how ridiculous how a historical in muslim apologetic circles they refer to hadith as science overshadowing all other sciences with its accuracy and reliability they even claim perfect preservation driven from the supposed authority of this method in reality of course the science of hadith equals deluded cultists evaluating the authenticity of Islamic urban myths with blind faith, confirmation bias, arguments from authority and other logical fallacies, and irregular methods that contradict proper science of history. Did early Muslims fabricate hadith? Or they are reliable, as Muhammad Kijab says. Let's see. Who was Imam al-Bukhari, the most famous Muslim to document Islamic hadith? He did not rush out to publish the book and made a lot of reviews, revisions and investigation until he came out with the final version to include 7,275 hadiths selected by Bukhari out of the 600,000 that he received. According to Bukhari, from the hadiths he collected, 593,000 were most probably fabricated. Okay, let's see the percentage. So, about 99% of hadith are fabricated, are most probably fabricated, according to Al-Bukhari. Mohammed al-Bukhari made a statement. From the hadith I collected, 99% are most probably fabricated. Did the science of hadith exist very early, as Mohammed Hijab claimed? Before Bukhari, eh, Mohammed? Did the science of hadith exist? Let's see. And even that, in the first few hundred years after this, after that, in our times, we don't look at the isnad that goes back to the Prophet. No. After Bukhari wrote down his isnad, that's it. End of story. So, if you like, for these two, three hundred years, a unique phenomena occurred that did not occur. We don't look at the isnad chain of narrators that go back to the Prophet after Bukhari wrote down his isnad. That is the end of the story. Of believing that because the compilers compiled the hadith, 200 to 300 years after the Prophet's death that the hadith didn't exist before that. How embarrassing. How ridiculous. Yes, Mohammed Hijab, urban myths existed before Bukhari. But did the science of hadith existed?
Eh? Guys, imagine this idiot saying a true thing in his life. Wouldn't that be amazing? Okay, so this is why this science is important for us to study, to appreciate, to realize the efforts the ulama have uh, spent in, in compiling the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ and in categorizing them. Who is the first one ever to write about this science? The sciences of hadith we're talking about, not the hadith itself. Realize there's a difference. The first one to ever compile a book was a person by the name of, it's a complicated name, Arama Hurmuzi, who died in 360 Hijri. Does this mean that the sciences of hadith were unknown before this time, 360 Hijri? The answer is a resounding no. Even the scholars of the, of the, of the, of the, of, of the Sahaba and the Tabi'un and the Taba Tabi'un, they had the rudimentary sciences of hadith established. Ibn Sirin, for example, narrates, Ibn Sirin died 100 The earliest Muslims didn't even care about preservation of hadith. Early Muslims had just the elementary of science of hadith. 300 years after the Prophet, Muslims wrote down a comprehensive hadith science in a book that evolved until 600 years after the Prophet, where the most used standard text of uh, science of hadith was established and kept evolving since then. He narrates, when the fitna broke out, we started asking the people, Narrate to us where you heard it from. Before the fitna, we wouldn't ask them. Wait. Just because people contemporary to the Prophet asked, where you got this from, that means they applied the science of Hadith. Unless the science of Hadith equals a simple question, where you got it from, that cannot possibly be the truth. Even the scholars of the of the of the of the of, of the Sahaba and the Tabi'un and the Taba Tabi'un, they had the rudimentary sciences of Hadith established. Ibn Sirin, for example, narrates. Ibn Sirin died 110 Hijri. He narrates, when the fitna broke out, we started asking the people, narrate to us where you heard it from. Before the fitna, we wouldn't ask them. Before the fitna, you wouldn't ask them. That means after Muhammad. The fitna guys, he is, he is referring to the apostasy. After the death of Muhammad, the, there were the apostasy um, wars, the apostasy wars. So before that, you didn't ask them, you didn't even ask them. Look how the idiocy of this person, guys. Okay, He just admitted that before the apostasy wars, the fitna, okay, they didn't even ask from where you got it from. You do understand that you just refuted the science of Hadith. God damn it, you guys are... are sh what can I say? Moreover, my friend, you are using Hadith that told you how Hadith is reliable. You are using Hadith that told you how the Hadith was reliable. So, Yasser Kadi, as I said, my friend, when I'm done with your science, not it won't even worth the paper it's written upon. Okay, I already refuted your science. You refuted yourself your science in the first ten seconds. Imagine what's, what will happen next. In other words, before the fitna, the fitna he's talking about is a big uh, fight that occurred between the Muslims, a political thing that occurred uh, in the later time of the Umayyad period. Okay, He's saying before this fitna broke out, we would accept hadith from anyone because we trusted everyone. Everyone was innocent, naive at that time. Not naive, but they were, if you like, they weren't capable of lying about the Prophet Wasallam. So that was the science, the most contemporary to the Prophet. The people that were contemporary to the Prophet, that all the stories are based. They couldn't possibly lie or make a mistake because they were naive. 
imagine, my friend, imagine Einstein going going to the next scientific uh, summit and people asking him, uh, please prove your uh, your special theory of relativity. And he's saying, uh, I said it, but you need to believe me because I'm not naive and I cannot make any errors because I'm not naive. This is your science. Is this your science that is so significant, that overstates all sciences? This is your science. They just, they are not, not naive. <sighs> Guys, I swear, Islam is the stupidest thing ever, ever, humanity ever came up. Okay, the stupidest. The stupidity of these people break every limit. Okay, it, it overstates every expectation. The Tabi'un of that time. The Sahaba, of course, they were above this. But the Tabi'un. Then Ibn Sirin said, when the fitna broke out, when this political strife and struggle broke out, which is a different topic, after this, we started asking the people, who narrated this to you? Where did you get this from? So this is the beginning of the science of Isnad. And Ibn Sirin died when? 110. When did he say this statement, the fitna? Some ulama say we're on the 60s of the Hijrah, 40s, 50s of the Hijrah. There's an ikhtilaf which particular fitna he's referring to, but within his life period, within his lifespan, that basically, very early on, very early on amongst them in the Muslim history, people started the science of Isnad. You say the Prophet and him said it, who told you? Where did you get it from? You do realize that the science of Hadith, it's much more than just asking. As you, as, you will, as you will demonstrate and explain right now. Unless all your explanation of what science of Hadith is, is just making a question, that means they, were, they weren't doing the science of Hadith. They were just asking a question. Where did you got that from? So even that, even that doesn't make sense. But anyway, let's continue. Not only that, Ibn Sirin went on. He said, فَيُنظَرُ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِ السُّنَّةِ We would look at the person of Ahlul Sunnah and we would take his hadith. And we would reject the person of Ahlul Bid'ah and not accept his hadith. The Khawarij, the Shia, the Mu'tazila, those early groups that existed, they would not accept their hadith. Only the person from Ahlul Sunnah that was trustworthy, his hadith was accepted. People who were in a specific sect of Islam that he agrees with are reliable. Hostile reports against the narrative of his cult are by definition unreliable according to the science of Hadith's official methodology. Listen to these guys. So, in other words, he accepts only the things that conforts with his narrative of what's true. Have you looked into his credentials? Have you looked into... Um, his background well yeah i mean i don't i didn't memorize them but not too long ago i checked them out and he just you know he's western educated so from the looks of it what he has learned regarding islam is going to be from the west it's going to have that oriental perspective which is essentially poison <laughs> so what western mindset implies to islam what orientalism implies to Islam. Reason. Skepticism. So, this guy just said that reason is poison. Continue. Yes. Yeah, I wanted to share a benefit that we can all come, come away with and remember. Um, there is this authentic quote of Ali, the great companion. May Allah be pleased with him. If this religion were based on opinion, then the bottom of the leather socks would be wiped instead of the top. But rather, I saw the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, wipe over the top of his leather socks. So there's two main points I just want us all to derive from this and to remember, um, especially as we react to this upcoming video. And number one, Islam is about following revelation. Islam is about submitting to Allah. Allah knows everything. He sent the Prophet, Alayhi Salatu Wasallam, with guidance. So we, we submit to that, we follow that. If our intellect, our conjecture, our perspective conflicts with that, we know the deficiency is with our own perspective, our own conjecture. 
So that's a very simple, but it's a foundational concept of what Islam actually is. No, let me tell you what Islam actually is. It's some kids playing in a playground, okay? And they invent stuff because, uh, I don't know, I, I don't know. <laughs> okay, they invent stuff. Hey, you are reliable, John. Yes, Peter, I'm reliable. <laughs> How about Mary? Is reliable? Muhammad said uh, reliable, maybe. And then with that, this kind of evidence, you want to enslave and subjugate the world. That is what's happening. That is literally what's happening. Okay. Okay. Where is Sahih Bukhari's original copy? Some of the researchers and those known with the honorifics indicating their educational qualifications have framed an important question regarding the absence of original manuscript copy of all Bukhari's that he penned down with his own hands. They ask, if Bukhari did author this book, why do we not find its original manuscript in his own handwriting? They say, the oldest extant copy of Sahih Bukhari goes back to the 4th century after Hijra, i.e. decades after the death of Bukhari. It is the copy of Muhammad B. Ahmad al-Marwazi who was born in the year 913 and died in 982. He listened to the Sahih from his teacher Al-Furabri in 930, who in turn listened to it from Bukhari in 866. How then can we trust a book attributed to its author without there being a manuscript written by him available to us? 2. Naivety of the question. It is regrettable that we live in an age in which such naive and absurd questions prop up, in the guise of academics and research. Who seeks the original manuscript copies of books in our day? Beginning with the Quran, we have absolute confidence in the preservation of Allah's book though we neither have of us a copy of Quran written in the presence of Allah's messenger, nor even an original copy of Uthman's Mushaf. In fact a very old copy of Quran discovered by the scholars in Germany went back only to the time of Harun al-Rashid 809. Though they concluded that it confirmed to the Quran we have with us today, it did not add to our trust and conviction regarding the Book of Allah, in terms of preservation. How has Sahih Bukhari been transmitted to us? There is no doubt that Imam Bukhari did pen his work al-Sahih with his own hand, however, he, also, recited it to a large number of his students who listened to it from him and copied it in its entirety. Thereafter, they checked it against Bukhari's personal copy. This way their copies were in accordance with the original one of Bukhari. Afterwards, came another generation who listened to the book from the students of Bukhari and compared their copies to those of Bukhari's students, and likewise it happened through subsequent generations, until the book became widely known. Therefore, the original one written by Bukhari was lost and had no implications, because it had been transmitted among the generations of students of Bukhari and its copies had become widely published each with a chain of transmission back to Bukhari. Commentaries to it were written, and all the copies are, by the grace of Allah and congruence. According to the Muslim author of this article, Sharif Mohammed Jabir, having the original manuscripts of Al Bukhari is not of importance. Yet it is. If you have a science based on a chain of narrators and you by admission missing two narrators, the student of Bukhari, Al Firabri, that then transmitted to his student, Muhammad B. Al-Hmad Al-Marwazi, who we have the earliest manuscripts copy from. By definition, any hadith from Bukhari missing this chain is incomplete, following hadith own methodology. Do we have a biography of these two individuals to evaluate their character and mental abilities regarding memory? Because the science of Hadith projects real devastating po political power in this world, it's imperative to have hard evidence. Yet, we don't see included in this supposed science any manuscript investigation. Instead, what we see is a naive understatement of the value of evidence by Muslim authors. To verify the Hadith, one have to verify Isnad. My question is how to check Isnad. Mean to say is there any early book of Islam, authentic, in which the series of connection between narrator are written? How we know that Imam Bukhari's father was taught by Imam Malik and Imam Malik and Imam Abu Hanifa was taught by Imam Jaffa as-Siddiq, 
or Hazrat Abu Baker or Hazrat Osman or Hazrat Abu Huraira was companion of Prophet Muhammad. Please don't get me wrong I am a Muslim but I am really confused that how the scholar of Hadith even nowadays can analyze the connection between Isnad. Please clarify with reference to the history books written during the golden era of Islam. There are two steps to this process. First get the list of people who reported this Hadith. If you visit websites like Sunnah.com you can see where the Sanad reported by. Second you will go through the books to research such people and understand them. Here is a list of some books unfortunately all are in Arabic, that you can read which describes many of the people in the Sanad and their stories. In Arabic they are called the books of the men. <coughs> Biography books are an essential part of the Hadith science. Now, where is the Isnad of the biography authors? Are they reliable? Are they without error? Did their memory abilities be checked? Do we have their manuscripts of their biographies? Ever before, and it never will occur. So this is why the average Muslim, he doesn't many times understand this. And so he falls into errors. The hadith have not been preserved. Likewise, the kuffar, when they usually attack Islam, they don't start with the Quran. Because they realize to attack the Quran is far more difficult. Even though they do attack it, they attack the sunnah. Because to attack the sunnah from their perspectives is easier. Because it's so confusing to many people. Not many people have studied the Sunnah. Not many people have studied the science of Hadith. The science of Hadith is intentionally not mainstream and there is intentional ambiguity around the science. Exactly because if people realize the mess of the science of Hadith and how laughably unreliable it is, they will leave Islam. Compared to the mess of the Hadith, the Quran is science. Okay, comparing to the Hadith, guys, the Quran is a scientific book. Let me give you an analogy to how, of how unreliable is Hadith. Imagine a broken telephone game lasting for 1,000 years and adding to that hundreds of thousands, liars and cultists along the way, twisting the info, pretending they are doing science. Guys, the science of Hadith is the most unreliable thing humans have ever engaged with. At this point, rolling dice to find the truth is magnitudes more reliable than trusting Hadith. Hadith is the definition of what you need to do to lose the information forever. Okay, the definition. We can call the science of Hadith the science of how to lose, misdirect, corrupt, and deceive. Hadith is the complete opposite of science. Let me repeat that. Hadith is the, the direct opposite of science is doing the scientific method in reverse. In genuine science, neutrality and objectivity is valued. Hadith science, though, values bias and religious conviction as the main factor defining truth. In other words, the more you love the prophet, the more objective you, you are, to say about the prophet. <laughs> I kid you not, guys. That is what they call science. In other words, the complete opposite of science. In genuine science, evidence trumps authorities. In hadith science, authorities trump evidence. In genuine science, hard evidence is our valued. And we try to eliminate the human factor. In hadith science, hard evidence are dismissed for opinions. This video will not be able to express the magnitudes of error in Hadith science exactly because the dimensions and the possibilities and the implications are so huge. Okay, it's like trying to, to decode the DNA code. Okay, endless. Okay, 
endless possibilities of errors. Okay, so this video won't be able to express in, a, in an efficient way the magnitude of error of the Hadith science. Because the interconnections are so many and so many factors that it's impossible to make justice to the stupidity of this science. But let's try. And here I'll give you a general rule of thumb. Amazingly, when you find this, this you will find without a doubt every time when a person attacks the Sunnah, write this down. This is a general rule of thumb. He will be the most ignorant with regards to the Sunnah. The general rule of thumb here. When the person attacks the Sunnah, oh, how do you know it's been preserved? Oh, how do I know this Hadith is Sahih and Adaif? That person would never in his life have opened up Sahih Bukhari and read it. He would never have studied the basic sciences of Hadith, much less the advanced or the detailed ones. It's amazing. When a person tries to refute a theory, you will find him to be an expert on it. That's why he'll say, well, the first flaw is here, the second flaw is here, the third flaw is here. As for the people that reject the Sunnah, especially amongst the Muslims, you find them to be the most ignorant with regards to the Sunnah. So how can you speak about a subject that you have never even studied? Even Ibn Qayyim and other ulama, they mention those that deny the Sunnah, they haven't even read Bukhari and Muslim. So they don't even know what they're denying. And the more you study the Sunnah, the more you study the sciences of the Sunnah and the Hadith, the more your Iman goes up that this science has been preserved. Yeah. Yasser Qadi, we heard that before. We heard that before. And we all know how that ended. That came, or not the shak, but the, the crisis that you had was in relation to this question of the relationship between the Ahraf and the Qiraat, basically. No, 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 the crisis I had wasn't that. The crisis I had was, well, yeah, I mean, that, that, that was what generated. But what was the crisis? The crisis was very simple. Traditional understandings of Ahraf and Qiraat cannot answer some of these pressing questions that are now being poked by our uh, people outside of, by our academics, not our, by their academics outside of the faith tradition. You see, in a Muslim environment, there's always some respect that we have for the Quran. We should. In a Muslim environment, we'll press a little bit and then we'll say, okay, khalas, sami'na wa ta'na. And that's great, alhamdulillah. In a Muslim environment, we'll press a little bit and then we'll say, okay, khalas, sami'na wa ta'na. And that's great, alhamdulillah. In a Muslim environment, we'll press a little bit and then we'll say, okay, khalas, sami'na wa ta'na. And that's great, alhamdulillah. The science of hadith is conducted by people who don't care about truth as much as they want to preserve religious convictions and social institutions and attitudes driven by the message of hadith they want to convey. Included in the method of science of hadith is confirmation bias, appeal to authority, admission of disregarding of evidence, psychological evaluations of historical figures and other errors deeming the method corrupted and unreliable just by looking the methodology guys just by looking to the official methodology of hadith this me method is unscientific and flawed so firstly i'd like to come to the sunni methodology of censorship when it comes to the vice of the, the sahaba he mentions in the mentions in his book Shira al Itikad, Itikad, page number 151. He says not to mention the vices of the companions, meaning it's not permitted to discuss the vices of the companions. Ibn Fawzan in his book, uh, again in the commentary of uh, Shira al Itikad, mentions in page two number 249, 252, he says it's not allowed to talk badly about any one of them, meaning any one of the companions. It's not permissible to seek their mistakes. Now, if some of them had any, not find them and show them to the people and stop mentioning any of their bad qualities and the conflicts. Now we'll come to another scholar, al Dahabi. He mentions in the book, Sir Alam, volume number 10, page number 92. He says, if it's proven that the speech of the companions was based on hate and partisanship, then it would not be acceptable. But it would be folded and not narrated. And it's argued that we must refrain from mentioning a lot of the quarrels between the companions and their fights. Therefore, if, i.e. meaning the reports, must be folded and hidden, mashallah, and it must be eradicated, it must be eradicated, even so that the heart will be clean and gathered over the love of the companions. 
and being pleased with them. And hiding these writings is mainly from the groups and some of the scholars. So as you can see, that when it comes to the uh, essentially the Sunni belief, when it comes to the vices of the Sahaba, they don't discuss them, they, they remove these reports, they hide them, they conceal them, they destroy them. In the uh, foreword that we didn't read is that all the special terms of the science will be um, translated and boldened and capitalized. And we're going to give priority to the English words just for the sake of understanding. So the author said, introduction. No, may Allah make your knowledge grow. That news, khabar, in and of itself, can be possibly true or false. For example, had it been reported that a man named Zaid is standing, this could be a true report or a false one. The sound mind alone does not deem either possibility more probable because of the mere claim. Both possibilities of truth and falsehood are equal, for this is the reality of statements. It is not the news itself that makes its truth or falsehood more probable. In other words, it's not simply because something was claimed that is true. False premise. It's not the news itself that makes it less or more probable. <laughs> what? <laughs> what are you talking about? The claim itself makes something less or more probable. For example, if I claim I have a car in my basement, that's more probable than if I claim I have a dragon in my basement. Okay, th guys, that is ch childish error. Okay, the claim itself makes something more or less probable. That's why substantial claims require substantial evidence. Or false. It is not the news itself that makes its truth or falsehood more probable. Rather, something outside of that news, certain clues, in, would point either to its truthfulness or falsehood. To the Muslims. You've been standing here for years, my friend, and you haven't bothered to ask someone like me how science of hadith works. Let me educate you. I know you're my elder, but I must educate you today. Yes, it will happen. You'll be educated, Jay Smith, by someone who is at least a third of your age. At least, actually, maybe, maybe not that bad. Okay. Mohammed Hitzab, the science of hadith is a joke, and you are a joke, my friend. Simple, okay? You are a joke almost as much as the science of Hadith is a joke. Okay, Mohammed Hijab. One of these days, one of this decade, you might said you might say the first true thing in your life, Mohammed Hijab. Because sorry for being the one who breaks that to you, you haven't said a true thing in your life. Mohammed Hijab. Okay, now go play with your friends. Come